So I'm gonna talk about pith, and specifically, I do not mean helmets. I do not mean the spongy white tissue at, a, at the rind of an orange. I mean the essence of something. What makes a cartoon specifically pithy, and how can I achieve that perfect pith? So the first thing I'm gonna show you is, uh, this is one of the first cartoons I ever submitted to the New Yorker. At least we live full lives. Um, and you can see, like, I think that the text is pretty pithy, but I was still working on the visuals. Like, I, I drew every blade of grass. I needed, to, I needed to include less. I only made this letter longer because I had not the time to make it shorter. Uh, I think this, this really applies to cartooning. Uh, I, I, the more you spend trying to make your cartoon pithy, like the better you do get. Uh, it takes time to learn how to say more with less. So just let me finish this drink and then we'll switch. This is that 133rd cartoon that I finally did sell to the New Yorker. <laughs> and just to give you an idea, I've since submitted over 350 cartoons and I've sold six. So it's a pretty masochistic enterprise. Um, but you can see I was starting to get at the back is a little grayed out. The, the foreground comes forward because it's darker. Uh, I think it's really significant that Polonius says this in Hamlet uh, in the middle of a very long-winded speech. So it, it, that humor falls out of the contrast from the fact that he, he's not very brief at all. Um, and a lot of times humor falls out of that tension. Uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons by Saul Steinberg. Uh, and he really gets at the point that humor is all about that dialogue. To make a pithy cartoon, you have to have contrast. So here we have the stony, unmovable no, and the movable but violent yes. Another Saul Steinberg cartoon. Here again, humor coming out of contrast, right? Uh, he's clearly not thinking and making this sign. Uh, so again, like that contrast creates that tension that makes us want to keep looking. Um, now we're leaving the hall of stuff we stole from other cultures and entering the hall of stuff we paid too much for. <laughs> so this is another of mine. Um, and I think it also has humor falling out of contrast, in this case with an oversimplification of a cultural hypocrisy. There's harmony in the bending back, as in the case of the bow and the wire. I think cartoons are like, kind of like Heraclitian fragments. They make you want to keep looking. They make you want to see all of the different pieces that come together and harmonize to make that humor. So this next cartoon is by Ed Steed. He's a contemporary cartoonist. And I think you really see the humor and the harmony coming out of tension here. We have these, these moody humans, right, drawing their ancestors. And there's the tree also moodily drawing his. But he, I, I think, has an extra dimension of angst about it. So shh, listen, the sound of my voice. This is a cartoon by Liana Fink. Uh, and I think in here, the humor falls out of the contrast between text and image. Uh, mansplaining can happen, even in the jungle. <laughs> so I think what's kind of interesting about cartoons is you have this extra opportunity to have another layer of pith, because there's unsaid visual things going on. So this is a classic cartoon by Peter Arno from 1941. Um, and it's, you can't see it on the bottom probably, but it says, well, back to the old drawing board. That phrase is actually invented in this cartoon. And you can see that foot violating the edge of the frame. You might not realize it when you just first look at it, but I think that's unconsciously actually bringing us out of the frame and back to that drawing board. You also see that Peter Arnold signed his name pretty high up, and I think that's so that he wouldn't detract from that foot violating the frame. And then you have the foot actually parallel to the crash, which I think is significant because everybody else is rushing in. So we get that tension and contrast highlighted in another way. Um, he's going back towards destruction as everyone else is trying to help in the classical sense. This is one of what I think is my, one of my more compositionally considered cartoons. You said you'd be home at half a candle. Um, so it's a classic mother-daughter argument, right? You're home too late, but I think that there's extra layers here. So you see behind the mother's head, we have 
her ancestors um, there with her, arguing for societal norms and decorum. And then you also see that she has a candle, which sort of represents man-made time and, and constructs. And then the halo on that candle mirrors the halo around the moon, um, which could symbolize natural instinctual time. And the, the, the young girl is on the side of the instinct here, home a little too late. And she's facing off with her mother uh, this, in this age-old battle between natural instinct and societal norms. But I think that sometimes the humor comes out of complete absurdity. So in this uh, example by Chaz Adams, who, who did The Adams Family, uh, we see just something that could never possibly happen. And the humor comes out of the fact that this is a completely unsolvable cartoon. You want to try to solve it, but you can't. And I think it's interesting that this cartoon is often used in articles about quantum physics. Um, light can be both wave and particle. The cat is both alive and dead. And humans can have their feet on both sides of a tree um, when they are skiing. Uh, but I just love that it captures that absurdity of the experience of life in such a simple image. So I think that my cartoons are still pretty far away from the platonic solid. They're much more dead plant than platonic solid. But it's super fun to try to achieve perfect pith, so I keep trying. Thank you.